My name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesiologist in New York City. In this video, I take you through 24 hours of being the on-call anesthesiologist at Elmhurst Hospital, a busy level one trauma center in Queens, New York City. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribe to the channel. Let's dive in. The very first stop that I'll make is going to get sign out from the overnight anesthesiologist and also get the pagers and phones, which I will explain to you shortly. Before we get too far, I should point out that this video does not contain medical advice and was approved by the Department of Anesthesiology at Elmhurst Hospital, as well as the senior administration of the hospital. And most importantly, there is no patient information shown and I am only recording in between cases while there is no active patient care. Having said all of that, when I got here this morning, there was already a trauma surgery that was in progress. The patient was very badly hurt by a motor vehicle. I'm not gonna get into any more detail than that, but um, suffice it to say, it was a very um, intense operation that was happening. Also, as part of my sign out from the overnight on-call anesthesiologist, I got all of the communication equipment. Here's the phone that I carry and then the two pagers that I have on me throughout the entire shift. And basically, if there is an emergency in the hospital, who do doctors call? Well, anesthesiologists, and this is how they get in touch with us. So specifically, if there's an emergency airway that needs to be taken care of, or if there's a patient who has a cardiac arrest, people can call us and we come in to help with resuscitation. Another reason that someone might get in touch with me is to schedule an urgent or emergent surgery. One of the big challenges that comes along with being the on-call anesthesiologist is that I have to triage along with the surgeons who are calling me to figure out what are the most important cases that need to be prioritized first. If there are multiple emergent cases that have to go simultaneously, there are actually backup anesthesiologists who are on call nearby who can come into the hospital at a moment's notice if we need to open more operating rooms. The other person who's on call with me at the hospital right now is an anesthesiology resident. So the two of us are the ones who run the cases that are here unless we need to call in for backup. The other type of phone call that I might expect to get throughout the course of my shift is for a patient who comes in with a stroke. So of course that's an emergency and typically will involve an anesthesiologist. So the interventional radiologist will get in touch with us to let us know if they need our services for a patient who is going to interventional radiology suite with a stroke. I'll go ahead and divide up this video by chapter. So you can click on the links below to get a tour of all of the different areas that I just mentioned, including an operating room where we do trauma, the interventional radiology suite, and the post anesthesia care unit where patients are recovering. What you're looking at is the aftermath of the trauma that came in this morning, the case that we took over. As you can see, there were a lot of blood products that were given, so it's not unusual when someone comes in with a life-threatening trauma uh, that they may need a number of blood products. And the device that we use to give those blood products when we need to give them rapidly is called a Belmont. So this is a rapid transfusion device that is a critical piece of equipment for trauma anesthesia. Right now we are waiting for that trauma patient to have a CT scan done. And once that's finished, then we'll have an idea of whether we need to come back to the operating room with that patient, or if we're going to proceed doing some urgent, but not emergent cases that need to go today. When there's an accident that happens out in the world, for example, a car accident and a bystander calls 911, the ambulance arrives and the hospital is also notified that there is a patient who is going to be coming into the emergency department. As part of that whole process, we, the anesthesia team, get notified that there's someone who's coming in with a trauma that happened, and we actually will go to the emergency department and evaluate the patient there. It's really important to have anesthesiologists involved in the emergency department when patients come in. This really helps with continuity of care. If the patient goes from the emergency department to the operating room and then wherever they go afterwards, most likely an ICU. Another role that anesthesiologists can have in the emergency department during traumas is airway management. Of course, emergency medicine physicians are trained with airway management, but anesthesiologists also have some unique skill sets. So if there's a particularly difficult airway, that's something that we may be able to help with as well. Keep in mind that traumatic events can actually lead to a difficult airway. For example, bleeding in the airway, a stab injury, or a crush injury. 
And since the most common cause of shock in a trauma emergency department, oh, here we go. Speaking of trauma, this is what it looks like to have a trauma reported on our page. So I'm going to stop recording and go investigate. Just evaluated the patient who came into the emergency department as a trauma patient. And like many trauma patients who come in, they are going to have to go to the CT scanner to get further imaging, to get a better understanding of what exactly might be going on with them. Uh, we may be taking them back to the operating room and we have another surgery that we need to get started as well. So in the meantime, we'll get one surgery started. And if we need to call in the backup team to take care of this trauma patient, then we'll do that. And in the meantime, lunch just got here. The resident who I'm on call with recommended a place by the name of Bolivian Llama Party. So reviews on that to come, well, time permitting. We do have just a brief break between cases as we're waiting for the CT scan to come back. And in the meantime, this lunch, I'm having a dish called a saltena, which I've never heard of before. And it is delicious, 10 out of 10. Without divulging any detail about the cases that we're doing, I will just make a public service announcement. You should always wear a helmet if you're going to be riding a bike or a scooter. Please wear your helmet. We're in a bit of a surgical holding pattern due to circumstances outside of my control. So we're gonna take a break from the regularly scheduled anesthesiology featured on this YouTube channel and turn this into a bit of a food vlog as we try out this quinoa kale salad from Bolivian Llama Party. On second thought, I don't really wanna eat on camera. So this is not gonna become a food vlog. I'll see you afterwards. We just finished a surgery and are waiting on our next patient to come to the preoperative holding area. So in the meantime, I thought I would show you what the interventional radiology suite looks like. Behind me, this is a biplane x-ray, which is used by interventional radiologists to visualize anything that's going on inside of patients' blood vessels. And as I mentioned, anesthesiologists are always available to provide our services in the event that a patient has a stroke, which, as I'm sure you know, is a very time-sensitive pathology that needs to be addressed right away. So from the anesthesiologist's perspective, a stroke can range from something relatively simple where a patient remains awake or just a little sedated to a case where we need to induce general anesthesia. And unfortunately, in some circumstances, there can actually be a lot of bleeding that's involved with the stroke. So we always have to be prepared to do any sort of resuscitation, including transfusing blood products and running vasopressors. So we have those available here if we need them. As you can see behind me, there's a standard anesthesia ventilator that's here. So we can do all of the things with this ventilator that we would expect to be able to do in any operating room. So I basically can feel like I'm right at home providing anesthesia in the interventional radiology suite. One of the occupational hazards that comes along with being an anesthesiologist is exposure to ionizing radiation, which is produced, for example, by the biplane x-ray that's behind me. Ionizing radiation can lead to all sorts of health problems, including cancer, birth defects, and it can even lead to cataracts. So you have to be really careful with this. And the most important ways that we protect ourselves, number one, is trying to get as far away, literally, from this device as possible, because the further away we are, the less radiation exposure we experience. Another important piece of protection is wearing protective lead that goes over our body. And then the other part of protecting ourselves is using a shield like this one that actually does stop ionizing radiation. So we keep the shield in the interventional radiology suite and put it between ourselves and the source of the ionizing radiation. Still have some time, so the next stop on our tour will be the trauma operating room. And as you can see, the cleaners here did a phenomenal job making it look like no surgery took place here at all. It's really incredible how well they have cleaned this up. After the operating room is cleaned, we come in and set up our anesthesia equipment so it's basically ready to go immediately if there is a patient who comes in through the emergency department and needs to go directly to surgery. What you're looking at is everything that you would need to place an arterial line, which is a special type of blood pressure measurement that goes directly into a patient's artery and we can see a blood pressure every second continuously. This is a connection for a rapid infusion catheter, which as I mentioned is used very frequently for blood transfusions. And the device that that connects to is this Belmont right here. As you can see, the maximum infusion rate here is 750 milliliters per minute, which just for reference, this bag of normal saline that's hanging up is one liter. So 
750 milliliters is getting this bag three quarters empty in one minute. In addition to a rapid infusion catheter, one of the lines that we wanna make sure that we have available for trauma surgeries is a central line. So here we've got a central line kit that we keep packaged so that it remains sterile until the time that it's needed. As far as medications are concerned, we keep unopened, but basically ready to go vials of vasopressors, for example, epinephrine. And then this is the tubing for the arterial line, as well as the Belmont rapid infuser and this is the pressure bag for an arterial line. A really important principle in trauma anesthesiology is avoiding hypothermia or a patient dropping their temperature. And for that reason, this rapid infuser actually has a warming device that's installed in it. And there's also a separate warming device that we can use in the operating room that's called a hotline. The hotline and the Belmont both allow us to warm fluid that's going through it and avoiding hypothermia is specifically important for avoiding coagulopathy, meaning any sort of disorder with bleeding. As you can imagine, a patient who comes in after being in a trauma is probably already going to be bleeding, and so anything that we can do to minimize bleeding is going to be important for the patient's safety. The other equipment that we keep basically ready to go in this operating room is airway management equipment and monitoring equipment. So that allows us to come into the operating room and do airway management, intubate the patient, or whatever needs to be done to keep them safe and also have them connected to monitors in a very short period of time so that the surgeons can get started addressing the problem that brought the patient into the hospital. Another special piece of equipment that's kept in trauma operating rooms is this point of care blood testing device that allows us to run a number of different blood tests without having to delay anything by sending blood to a lab that's outside of the operating room. So if there's a question that I have about the patient's hematocrit or any of the other lab values, I can run a lot of tests right here without leaving the operating room. And of course, no tour of an operating room would be complete without making sure that we have the anesthesiologist's chair. Of course, traumas can be intense and we might not get an opportunity to sit, but if things do quiet down, then of course we need to be able to make sure that we can rest our legs, which I think I'll go ahead and do until our next case starts. Later. If it looks like I've got more facial hair compared to the last time that you saw me, that's because I do. It has been a long evening. We have had quite a few cases going and we were running several operating rooms simultaneously for a while and that required me to call in the backup anesthesiologist to come in from home to staff those surgeries. But for right now, things have calmed down and I am a little superstitious. I don't like to set my ventilator to odd numbers and especially not 13. And I don't like to say the Q word, so I won't say it. But for now, we're looking pretty good. And what you're seeing behind me is the post-anesthesia care unit that I wanted to show you. This is where patients come after surgery if they're not going to the ICU. When I'm on a trauma shift like this, it's not unusual for patients to go, for the most part, to the ICU because these, after all, are emergencies that tend to be pretty serious. But for patients who don't require an ICU level of care, they come here to the recovery room, after which point they can either go home or they get admitted to the hospital. As the on-call anesthesiologist, I'm responsible for overseeing any patients who are in the PACU. Right now, of course, the PACU is empty, so I don't have any patient care responsibilities here. But when there are patients here, then I tend to them throughout the time that I'm on call. Of course, I'm not the only one who takes care of these patients. There are also nurses who staff the post-anesthesia care unit. And without the PACU nurses, we would not be able to take excellent care of patients. So I'm very grateful to them. And now that some time has passed since we've dropped off our patients in the surgical ICU, I'm actually going to head over there right now to post-op my patients, meaning we're going to see how they're doing post-operatively, see how their vital signs are, how their pain scores are, and how everything has gone since the surgery. I think it's a really important part of anesthesia care to follow up with your patients afterwards because it's good to see how exactly they do based on the anesthesia that you gave them during surgery and how well the pain control that you offered really lasted them. Just after two o'clock and we have wrapped up our last case for now. So I'm going to go see if I can get a little bit of shut eye. I'll have my pagers and phone next to me. So if there are any traumas that come in, surgeries that need to be booked, then people will get in touch with me. But we'll see if I can manage to get a little bit of sleep in the meantime. A few moments later, not but five seconds after I laid down, I got a phone call from an undisclosed service. 
talking about the possibility of going back to the OR, which obviously we can do, and they are following up with me right now. So I will find out our fate. Hey, it's Max. You heard it here first. I'm not going to the operating room right now. I'll try and sleep again. Let's see what happens. I literally feel like as soon as my body lays down on this bed, that triggers the phone to ring or a pager to go off. Let's try. So far, so good. Okay. All right, this is fine. Let's see how long this lasts for. A little longer than a few minutes later. I'm just waking up from getting about five and a half uninterrupted hours of sleep as evidenced by the crease that the pillow left on my face from being there for so long. That's an unusually quiet night at the trauma hospital like this, but I'm grateful for the sleep. And most importantly, that means that people aren't out getting hurt. The incoming on-call attending is here and I'm about to turn over the pagers and phone. But before I make my way home, there's one really important stop that I have to make. As was my tradition as a resident when I was rotating at Elmhurst Hospital, I always stop at Mira Cali Bakery in the morning after call to get a delicious pan de bono which is a traditional Colombian breakfast food in Cali, Colombia. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to take a trip back in time and check out this video of my very first overnight call as an anesthesiology resident years ago. Thanks very much for watching. See you next time.